This Skeptico, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Zakaris. And during the many years I've done this show, I've never had someone ask to come on and straighten me out about something I got wrong on a previous interview with them, or in this case, with their co-author. But that's exactly what we're going to do today. Dr. John Martin Fisher, a distinguished professor of philosophy at University of California, Riverside, which is right up the road from me, is here to talk about a couple of books that he's written, one that we featured in a previous episode of Skeptico, Near-Death Experiences, Understanding Visions of the Afterlife, and another one it, which is more recent, Death, Immortality, and Meaning of Life. John, welcome to Skeptico. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you, Alex. I appreciate the invitation. And uh, let me just clarify that one reason I wanted to come on the show was that when you had tried to reach me before, I was actually ill and away from my office for some months. And that's why I did not get your messages. But it was entirely my fault. And it seemed very rude, I'm sure. But I, uh, I apologize, and I'm happy to have the opportunity now. Well, I'm more than happy to give you that opportunity. And yeah, I did reach out to you initially, but I, wanted, I thought one way we could bring people up to speed is I did have a very good interview, I thought, with your co-author, someone who was a research fellow working underneath, underneath you, Dr. Ben Mitchell Yellen. And I thought one way to kind of kick this thing off is to play a clip from that previous interview that we did. And I'll go ahead and play that clip for the audience right now. Okay. We can start there. I have to say, when I play that clip, it's actually more generous to you guys even than I would be if I was kind of doing it again. But tell us, tell us why you felt like you needed to come back on and kind of set the record straight. Okay, well, first, um, again, I appreciate that opportunity. Um, there were a couple things that I picked up from that quotation, or that um, little excerpt. One was the point that all of the other near-death researchers, perhaps serious academic uh, researchers, have not come to the same conclusion that we did. You are wondering why. And secondly, the introduction to the chapter in which we were talking about near-death experiences in the blind. First of all, as you know, when we're doing thoughtful uh, analysis and reflection, we don't just count the number of people who are on one side or another. Uh, you know, you can find a lot of people on every side of any interesting controversial issue. Secondly, there are quite a number of researchers, uh, serious academic researchers, some of which we supported in the Immortality Project, um, who take a different perspective, not necessarily a supernaturalist. So, for instance, one of our researchers whom we supported was Sam Parnia, whom you uh, mentioned, and I'm a very good friend of Sam's. We're in constant correspondence and contact. I respect his work very much. We also supported Shahar Arzi in Israel, who does not take a supernaturalist approach, but he's a very thoughtful scientist. Uh, we also supported Mel Slater and uh, his wife, Maria Sanchez Viva, who are part of an ongoing research project in Spain using immersive virtual reality. And they've done some interesting simulations of near-death experiences uh, using immersive virtual reality, and they've studied it. None of those, as far as I know, has come to a supernatural conclusion. Uh, there's, of course, the work of Oliver Sacks. There's the work of Kevin Nelson, an MD and a neuroscientist at University of Kentucky, who offers interesting physical explanations in terms of the brain. So. There are a lot of people who don't there really agree. aren't, John, when you break down even your list there, you can start with Nelson. We've covered his research extensively on this That's show great. because Je uh, Dr. Jeffrey Long, who 
we're going to talk about in a minute, yeah. actually gave his data to Nelson to do the work. And Jeffrey Long kind of does a complete breakdown of how Ram intrusion, which is Nelson's conclusion, is completely kind of ridiculous. Well, Sam uh, Parnia, just... who, hold on, Sam Parnia, who you mentioned, comes to a conclusion that, and like you say, the supernatural kind of explanation, which we can get into in a minute. I don't, I don't know that these people are saying supernatural. What I hear them saying is that by our normal understanding of neurology, the current neurological model, consciousness seems to be surviving death in a way that we don't understand. And they say that repeatedly. And as far as people stacking up on different sides of a debate, that's not what's going on here. What's going on here are researchers who are open-mindedly analyzing, trying to understand, doing research into a phenomenon, and then coming to a conclusion at the end that is supported by their data. So this isn't a you know, Republican, Democrat, pro, against. It's just researchers doing the research. And all the researchers come to one conclusion. And then you write that's, a book that suggests that's not that that's true at all. Susan Blackmore did not come to that conclusion. Kevin Nelson doesn't come to that conclusion. What you said was Jeffrey Long has analyzed Kevin Nelson and allegedly refuted him. That's not to say that Kevin Nelson came to a supernatural conclusion. Secondly, um, how many researchers, it's interesting, it's a very small number of scientists who do study NDEs. And that's partly because until recently, it's been totally dismissed by the scientific community. Part of my work, as you know, is to try and say people who have reported NDEs are serious, honest, sincere people by and large, not everyone. We know the stories of Alex Malarkey and others. But almost all of them are serious, sincere people. I believe them, and we need to study them and study them carefully. Um, so I believe more studies should be done. But um, as it is now, you can pretty much count the serious academic studies on one or two hands. <laughs> Simply not true. You know, I mean, it's I had on Janice Holden, who, along with Bruce Grayson, published the Right, the handbook. Now, let me, let me interrupt handbook, you. The which references 200 and a growing number of peer-reviewed near-death experience research papers. And okay. one of the things I thought we would do today is kind of talk about this research, because your, your book is incredibly research light. It doesn't reference the research. And well, even today, when you talk about Oliver Sacks, he never did any research in a near-death experience. He discusses. He, in his book, Hallucinations, he discusses. He, he, discusses, he, discusses he never did any research. Just What like do you mean? I, I don't know. So, in other words, I couldn't do research on the uh, on slavery in the U.S. unless I talked to slaves. Is that it? I can't do any research on on any phenomena in history unless I've actually talked to them. I have, of course, talked to people who've had near-death experiences, and I've read the thousands. As you know, there are a dime a dozen. There are thousands online that you can read, and they've all gone to heaven and talked to Jesus. And they've come oh, back, they all gone or they've, they or they've ridden Jesus. on butterfly wings, or they've blah blah blah. Fill in the blank. I've read hundreds, probably thousands of those reports. Now, um, I don't. Again, I don't think we want to go into a counting match. I will say that Janice Holden, who's the editor of the Journal of Near Death Studies, sponsored by IANS, with whom you're very familiar, the International Association of Near Death Studies. I also consider her a friend. We've corresponded regularly, and she was kind enough and gracious enough to do a book symposium on our book. And Ben wrote a reply essay, and she was very professional. She's indicated informally that she plans to do something on my new book as well. So also, the reason I first got interested in near-death experiences was I was on a panel with Bruce Grayson. Uh, a panel in which we discussed ongoing research on immortality with the Templeton Foundation. On the basis of that panel discussion, I've kept in touch with Bruce. I, I, I respect his work greatly. Um, so I don't just dismiss these people, I know them. Uh, they refer to a lot of stuff. Um, 
200, even if there were 200 papers uh, on near-death experiences, I would say that's a tiny, that's like a grain of sand at uh, the beautiful beach there at Del Mar where you live uh, compared to the number of scientific studies we'd expect on any serious phenomenon. Yeah, okay. Let me play a couple of clips <laughs> okay. to kind of... Oh, may I before... Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you played something about the, the, our discussion of the blind. We introduced that chapter simply by saying, we have to be skeptical about what people say. Uh, you're a skeptic, and that's important. I'm not a skeptic. Well, you are a skeptic. skeptic about science, and you're... Well, I'm, <laughs> and let me you're, play this clip. Your book is, uh, but if I'll, I may... We'll talk extensively about okay. the blind. Okay. I, I, trust me. Go ahead. So, Dr. Long, let me probe a little bit further about the types of near-death experience research that's out there. Because over the years, I've interviewed a lot of near-death experience researchers. And, for example, you know, just the other day, I interviewed this guy, nice enough guy, University of California, He's doing his postdoctorate fellowship. He's part of a team. They receive $4 million Templeton Foundation to study near-death experiences. So I speak to him about his research. Turns out he didn't really do any original research. He didn't go into a hospital, into a cardiac arrest ward, and talk to patients there. He didn't, as you did, develop a 150 medical survey and give it to hundreds of near-death experience researchers. Yet he published his results. We talked about his book. He concluded that near-death experiences aren't real in the way that we're talking about. They don't suggest that consciousness seems to survive bodily death. So I guess the question is, for the average person who's trying to sort through this idea of near-death experience science, research, how do they sort through it? How do they know what research really holds up out there? The key thing is to know a few of the consistently seen elements of near-death experience that are the strongest evidence for their reality. For example, when you're under general anesthesia, it should be impossible to have a lucid uh, organized remembrance at that time. Uh, in fact, under anesthesia, you're typically so far under. With general anesthesia, they often have to breathe for you. I mean, you're literally brain shut down to the level of the brain stem. Um, and at that point in time, some people have a cardiac arrest. Their heart stops. And, of course, that's very well documented. Uh, they monitor people very carefully that are having general anesthesia. So I have dozens and dozens of near-death experiences that occurred under general anesthesia. And at this time, it should be, if you will, doubly impossible to have a conscious remembrance. And yet they do have near-death experiences at this time and they're typical near-death experiences. They have the same elements and appear to have them in the same order as near-death experiences occurring under all other circumstances. And in fact, a critical survey question I asked was what their level of consciousness and alertness during the experience was. Well, even under general anesthetics, under those powerful chemicals to produce sedation, if they had a near-death experience under general anesthesia, their level of consciousness and alertness was identical to near-death experiences occurring under all other circumstances. There's absolutely no way the skeptics can explain that away. It's impossible. Uh, that in and of itself is some of the strongest single line of evidence that near-death experiences have to be independent of brain functioning. There's simply no way you can be under general anesthesia and have a highly lucid organized experience like that, uh, and especially one that's consistently seen throughout near-death experience research. So that's uh, probably the strongest line of evidence we have that the physical brain, as we know it, simply cannot produce the near-death experience. Okay. There's a radiation oncologist, full-time medical doctor, talking about medicine. I mean, what's the response? The response is that we don't know exactly when the near-death experience, the phenomenology or the experiential content occurs. Two problems. One... I think I'd probably emphasize less. Our mechanisms for detecting brain activity are still fairly crude. They're not very sophisticated. Neuroscience is in its infancy or maybe its toddler stage, but we don't really have the tools to be sure when the brain function is suitable and when it's not. More importantly, consider an, a dream. People report dreams with 
content that spans a long period of time. But when did they actually have the brain activity that underwrites the dream? Typically when they're ramping up, when the brain is ramping up after being asleep, after being uh, not wakefully conscious, the brain ramps up and the individual wakes up. And we can do the studies that show that the, that the brain activity is plausibly um, underwriting the dream in the last 20 seconds before the individual wakes up. But let me just say this. I respect Dr. Long. As you know, my book with Ben, and I've done the two books, but my book with Ben Mitchell Yellen very carefully and thoroughly analyzes the book that um, Jeffrey Long wrote, uh, Evidence of the Afterlife. So if people are interested in a careful, reflective analysis of Dr. Long's results, that's a good place to look. He is an oncologist, but he's not an ontologist. He is not a philosopher. And these are not purely medical questions. These are questions about what we can infer from medical questions. What do they mean? And as such, a doctor, although, as you know, most doctors think of themselves as gods, a doctor is not the best person to consult about the philosophical meaning of what the patients say. So that's the, be the, be the, the bottom line is Dr. Long, and no one knows exactly when the individual was having this experience. It might seem like it was uh, over a long period yeah, of time. Yeah, John, John, you just, you just, and I went over this with Ben. I, I, I sent you that. I said, please go back and listen to the interview with Ben because you, you guys just aren't, aren't up to speed on the research. Here, I'll play you another clip. Here's the best research that directly addresses that. This is from chapter three of your book, When Exactly Do Near-Death Experiences Take Place? Here's Dr. Penny Sartori, had her on the show. Important research. I'll play you the clip for it. Uh, in my view, it's not important research. You know, there's so many ways to break down this topic of near-death experience. And as we were just talking about in this book that you've written, it's it's very inspirational and that's terrific. I mean, there's a lot to there's a lot to be inspired about, and there's a lot of culture change that needs to go around this. But the scientific angle, and that's what I always thought was terrific about this research, is as you know, there's been this ongoing debate. Well, you it's it's not scientific. They're just these anecdotal accounts. And besides, you could never study this scientifically. And I always like to point people to your research. And I say, no, here's really a, a, a wonderfully simple experiment that was done that one both adds incredible uh, scientific evidence suggesting the reality of near-death experiences, but also shows us a path how you can, you can apply science to this. Can, can you just go over in, in broad strokes the study that you did about people's recollection of their resuscitation and how the, one control, how the control group was set up and how that was basically done? Okay, so what I did was uh, over the, the period of five years, I interviewed for the first year, I interviewed every single patient who survived their admission to the intensive care unit. And I wanted to make sure that I didn't miss any patients. And what I found at the end of the first year was that I was actually spending longer in the hospital than I was at home. So I couldn't sustain that for the following five, four years. So what I, found, what I did then is I narrowed down the kind of uh, the group I was interviewing. So I only approached patients who had undergone cardiac arrest and survived. And although the sample was uh, a little smaller than the first year, what I found is that in 30, out of 39 patients who'd been successfully resuscitated, seven of them recalled a near-death experience. And that's, you know, it's nearly 18% of patients who survived cardiac arrest had this kind of experience. And what I also did is I documented their blood results at the time. I looked at the drugs that were given. And I also interviewed the, the staff members who were looking after the patients. So the nurses and the doctors, I asked them if, if it, one of the patients, if the patients reported the out of body component i would then try and verify what it was that they wrote uh, what they described and i would i uh, verified that with the, the nurses and the doctors who were looking after them 
With the control group, I had then patients who'd been successfully re resuscitated, but they didn't have a near-death experience or they didn't have the out-of-body component. And I asked them if they could describe what they thought that we had done to them. And, and they were like, what do you mean? I don't, I was dead. <laughs> I don't remember anything, right? Exactly. That's right. And they were saying, why are you asking me this? I have no idea what you did to me at all. I, and I, the majority of them couldn't even guess. They couldn't make a guess as to what we'd done. And then a few of them then did make a guess, and it was based on TV hospital dramas that they'd been watching. And what I found was that there were errors and misconceptions in what they thought we had done to them. And so some of them thought that they had been DC shocked with the paddles, and they hadn't. Those people had just had the resuscitation, the CPR, um, and drugs administered, such as adrenaline or noradrenaline. And then some of them made educated guesses, but the place where they thought that we'd put the paddles onto their body was completely erroneous. It was wrong. It was incorrect. It just goes to show that the people who did re report the, uh, the near-death experience described their experience with, with accuracy, whereas the control group weren't, weren't accurate, and they, most of them couldn't even hazard a guess. So, John, to me, this is near-death experience research. What Dr. Long is doing is near-death experience research. You mentioned the timing thing. Doesn't this address the timing thing with real research, well, somebody in a hospital, someone working with people who've had a near-death experience? Well, Alex, first, I apologize, but I really couldn't hear, uh, couldn't understand what she was saying in terms of the quality of the audio. Uh, can you just, in a couple sentences, summarize what she was saying? Good, thank you for the summary. Uh, I admire Dr. Sartori, or Penny Sartori. I've read her recent book. One thing I want to commend about her is she points out that one of the important features of near-death experiences is that they show something important about end-of-life care, about a more humane way of treating people at the end of life. Her own perhaps uh, the basis on which she makes that argument might be a little different from mine, but I do find it a very insightful point, a point that I myself want to develop further. I know she's very sincere. Um, I don't know that it's a double blind uh, project that was uh, overseen by anyone else. I know that she has very strong antecedent views about these matters. Uh, and I think confirmation bias plays an important role when you have antecedent views. Well, you would have to establish that. You would have to, one, how can you not even know of this research? I know, know of this research. I've studied this. Look, well, then, I, there then is was a... It, is it there is a, Did it have oversight or did it not have oversight? No, not that I've seen. And let me say this. It would be impossible, of course, to have read every study that's referred to, as you say, there, there are a lot of things out there in the internet and popular books. I've, pre I've read um, quite a number of books uh, by... I believe her research did have oversight by Dr. Peter Fennick, who was a colleague of hers. And as you know, Dr. Sam Parnia was also a colleague of hers. They were no, all doing Dr. this... Parnia, Dr. Parnia has an ongoing study called AWARE, of which I'm sure you are aware. And we supported it, the Immortality Project. Gave him $250,000. He's a good friend. As of now, in my view, and I think he would share this, he does not have a single case where someone saw one of the monitors that he places in hospital rooms and identified the number. Um, and he has pointed out that he had to make his study very, very carefully double-blinded because when he was first doing the study in Southampton, the nurses actually prompted the pa patients. Terror management and confirmation bias is so powerful that the nurses wanted the patients to tell Dr. Parnia the right answer. So they gave John, it you to don't, him. you don't, you're just kind of speculating I'm not, out there. I'm you not. You take the conclusions of I'm not I, hold, on, hold on, I've had him on the show. So I'm glad you've talked to him. I've talked to him too. I'd have him, I've had him on the show multiple times. And the first time he was kind of very much in this in-between zone of whether or not he thought that his data was suggestive of consciousness surviving death. Since then, maybe you know, he has come out and his conclusion is that based on all the research that he's done, 
he is of the opinion that his research is highly suggestive that consciousness survives death. So don't spin Parnia as saying something different. And as far as I'm the just reporting problems, that he does not have a single yeah, case. Those are, those point are it to very me. detailed methodological point it, issues. Point out to me. Where can I look at one single example where Sam, whom I respect, is a great scientist, has found someone who cannot see a computer monitor in their room and they are unconscious and they identify the number that's randomly put. Tell me where I can find it. That's he's been not working the only on this criteria. For, if you think he's, he's such a great researcher and you respect him, then why don't you respect his conclusion of a, multi -year, of a multi-year study in which he concludes what I just said. So the methodological issues in terms of seeing a particular thing placed in a particular area when someone's outside of their body has all sorts of uh, details to it that we've explored on this show. But it's not up to you to decide that that is the sole criteria. Again, that researcher's conclusion is based on all his research because he does research similar to what Dr. Sartori is doing in terms of asking people to recount yes, their yes, experience. Yes, it's very important. And his conclusion at the end of the day is that. Well, he is a thoughtful scientist, but as you know, you emphasize in your work that science doesn't even address the most important uh, things in life. Matter of fact, uh, you have a book that's called Science is Wrong About Everything, and, or something like that. And I think the point is that scientists and doctors only go so far. Then we're all, all human beings have the right to analyze and reflect on those studies that they do and on their conclusions. Now, if Sam, whom I respect, says some of his data suggest or even strongly suggest that consciousness survives the uh, failure to function of the brain, the death of the brain. I respect that. What he's saying is that's the suggestion. There's no proof there. There's no, and so we can agree to disagree. Uh, I'm sure that that, uh, I disagree that the data strongly suggests that. Let me say one of the people that Sam and various of the other supernaturalists invoke apparently wanting the authority of a contemporary philosopher of mind is David Chalmers. David Chalmers uh, is invoked by Pim Van Lommel and a whole host of others. And yet David Chalmers does not believe that consciousness survives death. He's a dualist, but not a substance dualist. He's a property dualist. He does not believe that consciousness survives death. So there are a lot of philosophical conclusions that are made by MDs. And those philosophical conclusions, people can reasonably disagree with. I don't think so, but <laughs> hey, that's why we have this show. Here's another clip from Dr. You don't, wait, you don't think that we can disagree with scientists' conclusions about uh, metaphysical matters? I thought you thought that science doesn't even deal with the most important questions and that, that they're wrong about everything, just about. Uh, yeah, we can get into that, but I don't need to talk about my own book. I will just mention. <laughs> well, you are, you're making I, claims you about my research. Well, okay, I'm happy to talk about it. I just didn't want to waste our time. My point. So you think book, we should agree with every, I mean, the scientists disagree, obviously. So we can't agree. Of, the premise of why science is wrong about almost everything, and it does get to the heart of the problem I have with your work, is that if science doesn't understand consciousness. If science can't get consciousness right, then science can't get anything right because we will always come back to the how many angels fit on the head of well, a Well, if you have question. cancer, who are you going to turn to? Well, you a faith healer? Jump around. You no, wait. Jump a around sci doesn't science these... have something to say about illness and how to treat it? And I, isn't that the best bet? I think that the, the we're mixing the philosophical and the practical. If someone in your family which, had a serious disease, would you go to uh, a faith healer or uh, someone who will read your palm? Or will you? But I thought you said science gets everything wrong if they can't get consciousness right. Who would you go I to? Said, I think I said almost, but I think we're getting <laughs> off track. I'd go back. That, that's the title of the book, Why Science is Wrong About Almost Everything. So you can snicker, but that's what it said. Back to Jeff Long. So see if you can turn up the volume so you can hear this one. It's, I'm it's trying. Because it directly addresses your research. 
Okay. And I'm going to push that a little bit further because here's where I was trying to lead you, really, because I, this has come up over and over again with me, Jeff. I'm not making this up. You know it because you see it out there. I mean, here's a book with all these academic credentials and you dig into it and they never spoke with someone who actually had a near-death experience. I, I, I've, I've had this happen over and over again. I can think of three or four in the last year where I've interviewed them, and I just want to I just want to scream and go, how is this near-death experience research? There's no people who had a near-death experience. That You know, that is an amazingly good point. It is astounding to me, too, that we have people that publish, write books, write scholarly papers uh, about near-death experience that have literally never talked to someone who had a near-death experience. Uh, that is some of the most bizarre research I can possibly imagine. Uh, it makes no sense to me, and I'm sure everybody that uh, sees this video is going to think, gosh, how is that even possible? How can somebody claim that they're doing near-death experience research and never ever even talk to someone who had a near-death experience? Well, the answer is you can't. If you're going to investigate near-death experiences, you have to talk to the near-death experiencers, and you have to understand what happened during the near-death experience. Okay, uh, I, I did hear that. Thank you. Uh, I better turn my volume down, though, now, because uh, you'll come come in very loudly. Uh, I respect Dr. Long. As I mentioned, much of the book that Ben and I wrote looks carefully at the logic behind his conclusions. Like I say, these are not medical matters purely. These are about the metaphysical uh, conclusions that you reach. And what we argued respectively, respectfully was that his logic is bad. And I would absolutely love to come on this program or any other program and have a friendly, uh, serious discussion with Dr. Long. I mean, if you could facilitate a debate, that'd be great. Or in any context, I would like to discuss. But the point is, he's coming to philosophical conclusions. And he is not, as an oncologist, uniquely suited to do that. Secondly, now, I would not know how to treat someone with prostate cancer. I, I assume he does, and I respect him. But when he comes to philosophical conclusions, he doesn't have any special authority. All of us as human beings can think and can use logic and should use critical thinking and logic. Secondly, I, one thing that I have always done, and Ben has always done, and I thought Ben did a very good job in his interview with you, we respect these reports. Unlike some people, we, we argue they really are being honest, and these events really occurred. They experienced that. The only question is what their meaning is. So we stipulate every, all these reports. I mean, what would we learn if we, I mean, if I did a thousand interviews with people, I'm stipulating, I'm saying, okay, everything they say is true. They had these experiences. It seemed as though they were riding on the wing of a butterfly. It seemed as though they talked to Jesus. Colton Verpo uh, thought that he sat at the table with Jesus and so forth. Stipulate all that's true. Now, what are the philosophical conclusions that you're going to draw? That's a different point. As you know, Alex, you could talk to thousands of people who've gone to faith healers, and they absolutely, they're sure that the faith healer cured them. They're sure of it. What would it help? I mean, I could go talk. And uh, let me also just reiterate a point. I suppose you don't think you could study slavery or its impact on people without actually talking to slaves? Or you can't talk about the economy of China without going and talking to Chinese people? You can study phenomena and study them very carefully and then pinpoint the issues that are important to you without going out in the field and, and doing field research. I could yeah, equally... But, but John, it's just, this is what you and Ben, it's kind of a silly discussion at some point. And we're just kind of rehashing the same thing over and over again. If you go back to Dr. Long's first comment that I played, and I think people will get this. So I don't want to just kind of beat a dead horse. He says, look, when you're under general anesthesia, you don't have a conscious experience as we understand it. That's the whole point. of. But anything. there's no evidence that anyone does. 
they are well, hold as they're on, John, coming let me out just, of let general me just anesthesia, finish. just like you wake up after a dream. You wake but, up but John, and your brain is ramping up. There's no evidence that they had the experience. Well, that's when why I played. They that's seem why. to. You don't. Just like you don't faith know healer, that. people no. seem to be healed by faith healers. Well, again, uh, you you are you are non-responsive. I'm to not the non <laughs> You're non-responsive to the research because this is what Doctor Long says. Doctor Long. Uh, okay, here's my suggests, response. Here's my response. You don't even know Doctor Long hears people say, "I had this experience while I was under general anesthesia." Now, my point is, you can have a million people say that, just like you can have a million people tell you that. Um, they were healed by a faith healer, or the cancer went away the because they took. Over and over they, they looked uh, at so crystals. So I play the Penny Sartori clip, and I show yeah, you there's someone who. How many people do you want who will tell you that went most out is and try to address the timing issue? Jeff Long addresses the timing issue. They and all say the same thing. response to Penny Sartori's research? Then you started saying, "Does she have a bias? Is she somehow uh, not being supervised, even though it's peer-reviewed research?" It's just it's it's just sloppy on your point. This isn't a philosophical question. There so, are philosophical questions related to it, but these are medical researchers no. who are really looking at the data. Penny, well, Penny, is Penny drawing blood, uh, looking at comes the blood. to the conclusion that consciousness is not in the brain, it's out there. It's somehow out there and uh, our brains somehow receive it. And Pim Van Lommel, of course, holds the same view and he highly touts uh, Ms. Sartori's book, I would say this. She um, deserves serious attention. Her insights about the relationship between NDEs and end of life, uh, those are important. And um, I can't just dismiss it out, out of hand. I don't have enough information sounds to actually like you assess did, though. it. I mean, it sounds like no, you threw I, I a lot of questions. dirt saying uh, whether No, she... I, I'm not the one who starts by saying that, our, that we are wrangling money from uh, the uh, Templeton Foundation and our nerdy little book doesn't engage with the science. You're the one who starts by accusing me of not responding to the research. I have responded to the research. No, the research, you haven't. Yeah, That's the point. Two points. One, our devices are not now capable of, of saying whether the brain is actually functioning in the right way. But more importantly, if someone wakes up from a dream and said, I dreamt that I was home with my father and mother when I was young and they abused me or whatever, or, the, or we had this wonderful trip to Disneyland, it does not follow. <laughs> that they were actually conscious back then or having conscious experiences of that time. Their brain was ramping up as they were getting to, ready to wake up. So the brain was functioning when they had these experiences. It seemed as though the experiences were of a, a long time ago, but they were actually underwritten by brain activity. And the same thing may well be true of near-death experiences and nothing that Dr. Long or Dr. Sartori or Dr. Van Lamo or any of them say goes to that issue. I am yes, responding. That's exactly what Dr. Sartori's research goes to. No. Is, it, the, is that issue? Is that if people have recollections that are verifiable of their resuscitation, that addresses the timing issue in a way that hasn't been done before? And I would mention. That, that I would have to look. Has been, me, that research has been replicated by Sam Parnia and Janice Holden. I don't know if you just don't understand this or if you're just kind of in denial, but that the, the reason they did that research was specifically to address this kind of goofy ramp up kind of thing or this these other things that people throw at it just because they don't understand they don't want to well, accept let the me, conclusions let me say this. that these researchers are coming to. I respect those people and I will at some point, I'm sure I'll look more carefully at what you're saying. Um, I would say that I have, just as you are skeptical of science and of the uh, conclusions that scientists sometimes come to, and just like you point out that the most important things about meaning and metaphysics and religion and ethics are not decided by science, 
I would want to look very carefully at their empirical results and look at what their conclusions are. And I don't claim to have the answers. I never, Ben and I never claim to have the answers. Uh, I, I just think that what one wants to do is be very, very careful about one's logic. Let me reiterate, if you could facilitate a discussion between me and uh, Dr. Long or Dr. Sartoria, I would welcome it and I'm sure I would benefit and learn from it. I would like to participate, just as, uh, just as I have discussed these issues with Dr. Parnia and our researchers in Europe and in Israel, I would love to learn from them. Well, you know, that if, if, if you want to do that, I mean, I guess I could maybe help facilitate that. But as I, as I played in that clip, I don't think anyone takes the, this philosophical research approach that you've taken, that it, it, just, it just doesn't wash. So maybe these guys would talk to you, maybe they won't, but they're out doing real research in the field, collecting data that is kind of meaningful from a neuroscience standpoint. I don't think anyone sees this as a, a, a philosophy first question. There's a philosophy second question about meaning and some of this other stuff. But in terms of sorting through the medical data, the, the philosophy can't, I don't understand why you think philosophy will help us understand. No, wait, what, what you said is these people are out doing serious work, but Dr. Long had the time to talk to you multiple times. Dr. Parnia had the time to talk to you, so maybe they would have the open-mindedness and willingness to have a friendly conversation with me. Reach out to them, John, if they want to do it. Well, I'm happy to facilitate it. I'm just, I, I, you know, I guess the wrap-up question would be, and you've spent an hour with me, and hey, you know what? Th this is kind of what the show is all about in terms of people yeah. who are willing to engage in right. discussion, and we don't have to agree on everything right. for me to respect the fact that you're willing to come on and you. defend your ideas and defend your book and defend your, your research. I, I guess the, the, the wrap-up question, you know what, forget about the wrap-up question because I've kind of hammered enough of that. Why okay. don't you tell folks a little bit more about, because we didn't really talk about the broader work that you do at UC Riverside, all the things that you're interested in, because it's not just near-death experience. It's a lot of questions surrounding death, immortality, and the philosophy of death. So tell people a little bit more about the other work that you've done. Okay, and I also want to thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. And disagreement, as a philosopher, that's our lifeblood. We're used to it. We're used to not being able to resolve questions. So I, I really, really appreciate it. And I believe in being strong in my, my views. Let me say that as we approach any interesting existential topic, we're going to want different inputs, not just philosophy. We're going to want medicine. We're going to want to read and, if possible, engage in as many interviews as we can. But I don't think we just want philosophy, and I, just, I don't think we just want interviews by MDs. We want the total picture, and we want a package that makes sense. And all I have pointed out is doctors, they think they know a lot of stuff. And they think they're authorities on just about everything. But even in medicine, you have to ask the tough questions of the doctors. Often they don't know the right answers. But when they are venturing into questions about meaning and metaphysics and the, the mind, they are not uniquely suited to make the analysis. We have to add in philosophy. But I, I really want to thank you again. I respect the fact that you're willing to consider different perspectives. And I have an, on, an invitation to discuss these matters with anyone. But let me say, I'm interested in life and death. I'm interested in what happens after we die. I'm interested in whether we could be immortal or whether we would want to be immortal, either in an afterlife or a secular kind of living forever. I'm interested in what near-death experiences can teach us about the meaning of life and about end-of-life care. And if you read my new book, uh, Death, uh, Immortality, and Meaning in Life, I emphasize the beauty and the awe-inspiring nature of near-death experiences and how they point us to the importance of guidance in the last part of our journey 
at least our living journey, guidance by loved, trusted mentors from the known to the unknown, and how important loving companionship is. Um, I think that this is the lesson of near-death experiences. So maybe what I could also say is my main area of research throughout my career has been on free will and moral responsibility and ethics. So I'm interested in a whole package of views. And when I got the grant from the Templeton Foundation, and by the way, I didn't wrangle it from them. They reached out to me. And I believe you'll find that they're very, very happy with the results. And we have a legacy page, which your listeners and viewers might be interested in. They could just Google Immortality Project legacy page or uh, SPT, that stands for Science, Philosophy, and Theology, Immor SPT Immortality Project.org. You'll see there are over 100 books and articles that came out of it. Scientists, philosophers, theologians, religious believers, atheists. Um, what, I, what I wanted to say is I never even knew about near-death experiences until I got the grant. That was seven years ago. I want to emphasize I have not spent my life on this. One of the big emphases of the Templeton Foundation is humility, intellectual humility. I openly admit I am not a world-class expert on these. I'm a human being, I'm trained as a philosopher, and I bring my perspective to what I hope will be a holistic investigation of these matters. Okay, well, great, John. And again, we can be the mutual admiration society in terms of okay. engaging in these uh, discussions, these conversations. Yeah. So thanks again, and I, I will, uh, I will bounce the idea off of uh, Jeff Long. I'm not Good. sure I can put another, I've done so many of these yeah, interviews yeah. on your death experience, but hey, it's awesome for you to, to want to reach out in that way. So thanks again so much okay. and take care. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks again to Dr. John Fisher for joining me today on Skeptico. The one question I'd have to tee up from this interview we try and spit this out. Our indie is a philosophy first question. When we really boil it down, that seems to be the, the main thrust of John's argument. And if you go back and listen to the interview that I did with Ben, his co-author, which I have to say, I went and re-listened to it. It's, it's a really good episode, if I must say so myself. So I'll have a link to it, and I hope you go back and listen to it. There's a lot of great old episodes back in the vault there. But in that previous interview, Ben expounds on this theory of how philosophy can really explain near-death experience. And he uses an analogy of a fire. And he says, you know, if you have a fire in your house, and somebody looks at just one cause of the fire, then they may be missing the interrelationship between multiple causes. Now, this seems to me like an incredibly, incredibly naive view of what near-death experience researchers do on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, I think doctors are always looking at multiple causes and how all variables need to be controlled. But maybe I'm missing something. Maybe there's some deep, deep philosophy there that I didn't understand. So let me know your thoughts on this question. As always, the best place to reach me and to talk about other people who are really into this show is through the Skeptical Forum, which you can find through the website, or you can find just by going to skeptico-forum.com. And be sure to check out the Skeptico website where you'll find this show and many, many other previous shows all available for free download, MP3, take and go, do what you will. And uh, while you're there, you can check out other things. You can subscribe to the newsletter, which is really just kind of a reminder that a new show is up. And you can also find contact information, other stuff like that, if you need it. Well, that's going to do it for today's show. 
sometimes people get frustrated that I keep hammering on skeptics, but I feel like I've laid down the gauntlet with the anytime, anywhere debate. So when people raise their arm and say, hey, I got, I want a debate, I'm 90% of the time, I'm up for it. So, and I was up for it with John, and he's a brave man for coming on and defending his book. So that's going to do it for this episode. Until next time, take care and bye for now. Mm -hmm.